Wonderful. So we're recording. That's great. Let's begin the active part of our meeting today. So welcome everybody uh, to the 92nd monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group. Again, it's a purely virtual one. Um, no one knows when we'll be able to meet in person again, but we've somehow gotten used to it uh, quite a, a bit now. Um, the topic today is from value chains and circular economies to system value cycles. Um, our esteemed guests from our three today, Bill Bowie and Ralph Torm, um, glad to have you here. Um, for those of you that haven't been to these meetings, I see quite a few new faces. Welcome. We're glad to have you around. Um, we hope you enjoy it and feel free to let us know um, what you thought about the meeting and if you have any suggestions for improvement after. Um, I'll just do a short introduction before we get to the fun and important part of R3. Um, and at the beginning of these meetings, we would like you to consider um, two kinds of privileges, actually. One is a more social privilege, um, which has to do with the land on which all of us are, no matter where we are right now, um, and the fact that we're privileged to be on sacred land that has supported human beings for thousands of years, and that's rich in history, knowledge, and tradition. And we are, of course, privileged to be beneficiaries um, and stewards of all that has come before and on behalf of the seven generations to come and beyond. I think in uh, these times today, it is not just that privilege that, should be, that we should be mindful of, but there are a lot of privileges that each and every one of us um, can consider and, uh, and rethink. And uh, so this is an inv invitation from us to you to, to consider where you are privileged in your life and what you can possibly um, do. Another privilege, um, another acknowledgement that we want to make is more of an uh, environmental one, which has to do um, in the specific case with uh, the watershed that you're in. What we want to do here is we want to get you to think a little bit about the land again on which you are and the ecosystem services that that land um, and the planet provides to you because we tend to forget about that. So those of you that are in Toronto, um, you are in a watershed known as Russell Creek, which became a sewer in the mid 1870s after being heavily polluted. Um, we, want to we want you to think, or we want to invite you to think of this watershed as a co collection of biophysical stocks and ecosystem services upon which we are all interdependent. And um, this does not only count for ecosystem services, such for example, as the, the sewer system that we're dependent on, but we can also think about the communication that we're having right now, the laptops we're communicating on, all of that is dependent on ecosystem services and biophysical stocks. So again, this is something we would like to invite you to consider. Talk a little bit about our group for those that are new. Um, we're a community of innovation, practice, and research, and our focus is on the design of enterprises that are what we call fit for the future. Um, we consider enterprises fit for the future um, if uh, they sort of follow and um, accomplish a normative purpose, which we call flourishing. Um, for that, we offer a global network of possibilities for your education, research, and employment. And I think this is being myself, a still relatively new member of this group around a year, something that I've very much experienced. That's very true. It's a network that you can enter very quickly. People are very open for collaboration, for cooperation. And um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of um, competencies and skills in this group that are very fun to interact with. Um, we have a couple of streams of interest. I'll just invite you to join or look at our wiki page where you will find out much more about this group. And um, you can see our past presentations and recordings on our Google Drive. So if my laptop doesn't, no, there we go. Um, we would like to think that we're contributing to a growing and worldwide movement uh, for flourishing enterprises. And the goal here is to create impact at scale quickly, to create a world where enterprises excel because humans flourish and nature thrives. Um, so all of this is based on transdisciplinary science, systems-based science, indigenous knowledge, ethical and moral frameworks, and through this, we consider ourselves to be not only in sync with the UN SDGs, but uh, even going beyond the SDGs. 
So this movement, um, some of the logos which you see here, um, we're, we, we sort of consider ourselves uh, a part of this movement. Some of these logos you might recognize, some of, you, you'd, uh, some of them you might not. I very much invite you to look them up. They're all uh, unique and very interesting and, and, and valuable contributing um, organizations. Some of those are more closely attached to our group. Some of, are less, some of them are less closely attached, but it's, uh, it's become a global movement that we definitely see as a growing movement. And that's very exciting to be a part of. <laughs> Um, some of the logos on this uh, slide were a bit more closely attached to our group. So these are initiatives that the members of our group have formed um, in order to, to do good, to do well. Um, so what this means is that members uh, here can come together in initiatives at any time to drive their desired impact. And it is really up to you um, to find a way to do good, to do well, and to motivate other members to join you in your uh, quest to do so. And so these are just a few of the initiatives that not all of them have come out of the group. Some of them are associated with the group. Again, I want to invite you um, to, to look into these if you are uh, willing and wanting to find out more. And uh, last but not least, uh, we're also a collaboration hub for strong sustainability in the sense of um, scientific publications, book publications, conferences, um, most notably currently, I would say the R3 international conference this year in September, which you will be hearing uh, quite a bit more, I'm sure, about um, once we get into the presentation. Um, very excited, uh, a fully virtual conference this year in September um, by our presenters today. And lastly, um, we do have proactive uh, community animators, facilitators. That is Laurie Farley, who you can see <laughs> waving at you right now and smiling at you. And uh, myself, if you have any questions about this group, if you would like to get involved, if you would like to help, please reach out to us at any time. We're willing and uh, very happy to connect you to other members and to facilitate um, whatever uh, action you're looking for. So definitely feel free to reach out to us at any time. This was a short introduction today to our main part, um, which is uh, Bill Bowie from R3, the senior director from R3, presenting today as we are still, I think, in the public comment period to the value cycle blueprint um, from linear value chains through the circular economy and thermodynamic accounting to value cycles, spirals, and webs. And if you did not catch all of that, I'm sure he will <laughs> say a lot more about it in a minute. I'm very excited uh, to introduce Bill Bowie and um, also Rob Thurm, Thurm who's uh, joining us today. Um, very uh, valuable, important members of this group. Um, and uh, I'm very, very uh, glad that you're here today uh, to talk to us about your conference and uh, your book. So Bill, I would invite you to share the screen. I will stop my sharing. And um, please go ahead. OK, let's see. Uh, it says that you disabled attendee screen sharing. Huh. So I think you'll just need to make me host or call. I will do that. OK, you should be host now. OK, great. <laughs> and I will share my screen. Uh, there we go. While you do that, um, let me please remind everyone to please share your name, location, and affiliation in the chat so we can add it to our attendee list for this month's meeting. Thanks a lot. Okay. And any questions that you might have during the presentation? Sorry? And any questions or conversations that you might want to have during the quick, uh, presentation? <laughs> Yeah, and um, it would be great um, if, uh, you know, I'm, I've got plenty of material to present, um, but also if people have questions um, in the flow, please, please feel free because, you know, this blueprint is publicly available, so everybody is able to, to check it out. Um, I can't see the chat, so um, Tim and, and Lori, if you could just uh, alert me or, you know, uh, I've, I've presented a ton, so I don't get phased if people chime in. <laughs> um, and I also will just mention that, you know, Ralph um, Thurm, the managing director of R3.0 and my close colleague uh, and lead, lead, uh, co-lead author of this um, is attending, but uh, he's in Central European time, so this is quite late for him. So he's, uh, uh, um, we both agreed that it makes sense for me to do this presentation <laughs> and not, not, uh, not um, rely on him for, for input. Um, 
So uh, first off, thank you very much, uh, Tim and Lori, and to the whole SSBMG community. We've been members of the community for quite a while now um, and have really um, appreciated our participation, um, including in the launch of the Flourishing Enterprise Institute uh, last summer, which I attended up in um, Waterloo uh, and continue to be involved there. So um, uh, definitely appreciate this uh, global network um, and the work that uh, everyone here has been doing for, for quite a while. Um, so uh, I will um, present uh, on the Value Cycles Blueprint. Mm -hmm. Um, as you may know, this is uh, open for um, public comment right now. So if people uh, are interested, that is posted on our website, uh, r3-0.org. Um, so please feel free to check that out at any point. Um, okay, so just a, a few words about R3.0. Um, we began our life about seven years ago as reporting 3.0. And just this last year at our conference, we announced the decision to shift our, our name to R3.0, standing for Redesign for Resilience and Gen Regeneration, mm -hmm. uh, out of the recognition that really we were covering a much broader uh, scope than um, just reporting um, where we had sort of come from. Um, and so we are a, a global uh, common good not-for-profit platform um, and, and community and network um, and we crowdsource uh, open recommendations for necessary transformations um, drawing from this community. Uh, and in the specific context of the ecological and social collapses that we're facing with the ideal of um, pivoting that and making a, a paradigm shift and transformation to thriving um, and regenerative and distributive e uh, economy and society. So these are our links. Um, we have a pretty good Facebook, LinkedIn, and Medium and Twitter presence. Um, very quickly, I'll just mention the, 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 the foundations of the blueprints that we've uh, done up until now. So this is what we call our work ecosystem. Um, our first blueprint was on reporting, um, where we really had our roots. Um, and, and all of our blueprints um, are essentially gap analyses. We basically identify through a crowdsourced literature and practice review um, with our working groups of between 20 and 40 experts globally for each of these blueprints. Um, we crowdsource uh, uh, um, what's, what's the current practice and as well as the current ambition and then we uh, say, well, if we compare that to the, the scientific and, and uh, ethical normative state that we at least need to be at sustainability, much less um, uh, thriving, but we need to at least get to sustainability. Um, will we get there uh, if the current practice and ambitions even are, are fulfilled? Uh, and our hypothesis is no, we, we would need to go further, and that's what we, we explore in each of these blueprints. So that's what we did with reporting, um, with accounting, um, with data, and new business models, and that's the area where we had most participation from this community. Um, we rounded all of those up into a synthesis blueprint called the um, Transformation Journey Blueprint, and that was our first phase of blueprints. We're now moving into our second phase um, with the Sustainable Finance Blueprint that we just released for uh, public comment about a, a half month before the, this Value Cycles Blueprint. Um, we've still got a, a, a good couple of weeks left in the public comment period for this blueprint. We have two other um, blueprints coming up in the future, one on educational transformation, where we already are putting together a working group for that, um, and then a future one on governance for regeneration, um, particularly looking at the role of governments, multilaterals, and foundations um, both on their programming for transformation and regeneration, as well as their funding. 
Um, so glad to, to, to speak with folks about those working groups um, coming up. So now let's jump into the value cycles blueprint. Um, and first we'll lead with uh, the epigraphs that we um, frame things around. Uh, so this is uh, um, uh, somebody who came onto my radar screen from one of our working group members, Hank Hedders. Uh, so this is Peter um, Tunjik, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but um, uh, I, I hope so. Uh, he basically is um, you know, pointing out that right now we are essentially um, decapitalizing. We're basically taking across the multiple capitals, we're taking valuable capital such as natural capital and social capital, and we're reducing their value by transforming them into financial capital. So as he says, you know, this transformation is inefficient. The result is more money but less value. And uh, he points out that this paradox is at the root of neoclassical economics. Um, and what uh, what he sees is that this paradox essentially is creating what he would call a value crisis. So that's sort of where we're, we're um, framing things right now is that we are literally in a value crisis. Um, so what might we be able to do about that? Oh, okay, there we go. Uh, so one of our partners and a working group member of this blueprint, James Quilligan, um, had this to say very recently, that we are being asked to do something that we've never done before, create a system va of value uh, that is equitable, sustainable, and inclusive, mm -hmm. um, requiring an awakening of the heart and uh, fulfilling our deep-seated yearning for interconnectedness yes, yes, across yes. Uh, the intergenerations uh, through the generations. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit of feedback there. Yeah, maybe ask you to please um, shut off your sound if possible. I think someone. Yeah, I think somebody just joined in. Just joined, yeah. Yeah. It seems okay now. Great. Yeah. Uh, and then most of you would know uh, Mariana Mazzucato, um, uh, whose book on value, the value of everything in 2016 or 17 um, really made waves. And she's calling for uh, the recognition that uh, value is creative, created collectively. And so in her mind, the fact that we haven't recognized this um, uh, creates the opportunity for a, a new economics of hope um, that's really tied into our dreams of, of a better future. And I think that's something that really binds everyone on this call uh, together. So that's um, essentially what we are, are framing this um, blueprint around is this notion of a value crisis um, that, uh, that can lead to uh, um, a new system of value that's animated by our hearts, hopes, and dreams, and fed by this interconnection and regeneration that um, James Quilligan in particular mentioned. Uh, so is this transformation to a new system of value actually possible? And more importantly, if so, how, what would a new system of value look like? So that's what this um, blueprint really looks at. That's the fundamental question uh, or questions that this blueprint asks. Um, so what we're advocating for is a radical reconceptualization, uh, reconceptualization of our system of value as what we call system value. Um, and we will get into that later. Um, but that system value is essentially creating value uh, across all of the system, ecological, social, and economic being the ones that are most often identified. But as one of our um, partners globally has pointed out, that that's not necessarily exhaustive. Um, we also call for transcending our current infatuation with circularity. And so one of the things that we look at in depth is the notion of uh, cycles, uh, and in fact, note that natural systems typically function in cycles and spirals, um, and they do so 
uh, in a uh, uh, in a form of proportionality or in a fractal way that um, we believe provides us a, a design um, framework, if you will. So that's uh, in in essence what we are proposing in this value cycles blueprint. Um, the outline uh, is we uh, first provide an introduction where we ask the question, what is value and what are cycles? So we really start at the very beginning. Um, sorry, I didn't realize I had um, put those on, on build out. Uh, then we go through the question of value and we look at essentially a continuum or a um, uh, a, a, a movement from uh, shareholder value through Porter and Kramer's notion of shared value, uh, a newer notion from Paul Barnett called valueism. We then pause and look at the question of valuation or monetization or financialization uh, and how that's being applied in the sustainability or ESG field as impact valuation. Uh, we identify the shortcomings of that as a way to advocate for system value. Uh, and we then also note that um, this has to take into account the, the intrinsic value that is often not captured um, by these other forms of valuation. Uh, on cycles, we do the same thing. We go from Porter's notion of value chains that is stuck in a linear mindset of the economy uh, through the current, um, as I mentioned, infatuation with the circular economy, which of course we, we, we embrace, but we recognize that we really need to go uh, transcend and go beyond uh, just a circular economy. Um, we also recognize that um, circular economy in particular, um, there are elements of thermodynamic accounting that need to be taken into account. Uh, and uh, we focus on the bioregion and bioregional circulation um, as a particular scope uh, of, of implementation of a, um, of a cyclical economy. Uh, and so, we then pull that together in the notion of value cycles where we say systems plus value plus cycles um, leads to regeneration and thrivability. Um, and then we synthesize this system value cycles into the R3.0 work ecosystem um, that includes uh, baselining a regenerative and distributive economic system. So what would be the baseline for creating that? Uh, and then we create uh, targeted recommendations. I'm not going to present all of this in this um, presentation, um, but that is the overview of what it, it covers. Uh, and again, um, as I'm going along, if folks have, uh, particularly as I, I get into the meat of this, if, as, if folks have um, questions, please do ask. Uh, so this is just a visual uh, overview. Uh, it presents essentially what I, um, had just presented um, and goes into a little bit more depth, um, but this is uh, available uh, in the blueprint. So I'm only going to pause here since I've uh, uh, already essentially presented this. Um, and to get to the question of what is value, um, let's start with uh, this quote from Frederick Douglass from his archives. Um, he wrote, uh, he said this in, in 1864, uh, where poets, prophets, and reformers are all picture makers. And this ability is the secret of their power and their achievements. achievements. They see what ought to be is the reflection by the reflection of what is and endeavor to remove the contradiction. So this in many ways encapsulates our notion of value and this question of what is compared to what ought to be and the idea of removing the contradiction between the two. Um, so I'll, I'll explain that in more depth. Um, also on the question of, of pictures, um, I just want to introduce, uh, many of you know, of course, uh, Kate Rayworth. Um, she's spoken at our conference this past year. 
um, and we integrate her donut into almost all of what we do at R3.0. But in particular, um, we actually just got uh, feedback on this. The, 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 the point that she makes about how we picture things. Um, so talking about if we're wanting to rewrite economics, we actually need to redraw its pictures because it's the pictures that have even more mimetic um, power, if you will, than, than the written word per se. And I would argue that that's why the donut, um, in fact, it's, it's, it's sort of its quirkiness um, and its um, inaptness, I think, is part of why it, it went um, viral, is, is because it's kind of like a, um, uh, a, 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 a not perfect um, metaphor. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of the one of my previous uh, um, mentors or uh, guides in in uh, academ academia uh, said that metaphors get their dynamic power by being an imperfect fit. So that's uh, that's the foundation. But now let's really go into the definition of value. And so what we did is we went back to the um, uh, arguably the the the, the um, sort of godfather of value theory, uh, Everett Wesley Hall, and in his book, what is value, raised this very question and ultimately uh, condensed it to its most distilled format in his masterwork that was published after his death in 1961, uh, our knowledge of fact and value. And what he said is that value is claims embracing the fitness and desirability of possible facts. Um, so we're gonna um, unpack that a little bit, but let you um, uh, think on that. Uh, essentially, fact claims are about the way that things are, or uh, in the descriptive sense. Value claims are about the way things ought to be in the normative or evaluative sense. So sometimes, uh, as Frederick Douglass had suggested, um, facts are equivalent with values. So what's, what is aligns with what is fit and desirable. So it's proving that that is actually possible. So value is realized in that sense. Other times, uh, however, and I would um, make the case that this is actually quite a bit of the time, uh, facts do not equal our values or what is that does not match what ought to be and therefore value remains aspirational. So, um, um, Bill, may I ask just briefly, uh, yeah. From that definition you just gave, um, w does that mean that, for example, if I'm thinking of a service and the service is, is not bad, but it could have been better, right? So it wasn't what it ought to be, but it, it was still okay, like a concert, for example, that didn't last as long as, as I would have imagined it to last. So it, it wasn't what it, what it ought to be, but it, it still was okay. Does that mean that there's no value in that, con in that concert, you know, according to this definition? Right. Uh, th that's, a, that, that's a good question. Um, the question is if it's, uh, you know, is it fit and desirable? Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, did it did, fit meaning did it do its job um, and desirable meaning did you, was that something that you desired and did it right. sort of uh, fulfill that? Or is it something that we would collectively, that we would want um, as compared to something that we wouldn't want? I see. So the, the question of, of gradations actually does come up later, um, mm -hmm. and let, let, in fact, let me let me let me come back to that when when we get to that. Sounds good. Thanks. Great. So one of the things um, one of our our partners um, uh, in R three Mark McElroy, um, actually when he was defining sustainability, and and we'll see this in a moment. Uh, he noticed, uh, or he articulated that you could um, uh, uh, state this relationship between is and ought, um, which is actually, um, you know, those of you who have a background in philosophy, the, the, the is-ought relationship is, is certainly not new. And, and the fact that Fred, Frederick Douglass 
was sort of identifying that in, in uh, 1874 is not accidental. Um, this goes back to the work of, of Hume in, in particular uh, identifying this. But uh, if, we're, if we're looking at an equation version of it, it's essentially a, 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 an, a, um, an equation with is over ought with um, what we're wanting to do is, is move towards is equals ought. And so this is where, um, uh, Tim, this starts to get into what you're saying, that it, at the individual level, what's considered a value, so what's fit and desirable may vary. And as you're saying, it, there may even be gradations within your own experience. So for this blueprint, what we said is, look, we really need to come up with a sort of a universal baseline. So what is it that we can say that, that everyone can agree is value? Um, as, as, as a starting point, so to speak. And so we believed that essentially the, the conditions conducive for our continuation or what we call sustainability would be the baseline. So this gets to your, your question of, you know, was it as good as I wanted? Yeah. Well, yeah, there's, there's value. There, there are gradations of, of value, but we're saying that if we're, if we're sort of trying to draw a line that everyone can agree to, that aligning that with sustainability seems to be, or that's our, our, our thesis, right. um, uh, that we all do actually, at the very least, want to have the ability to continue. Right. Um, so whether that's actually flourishing to, to um, uh, you know, Aaron Feld's definition of, of sustainability is, is actually the ability to flourish. Um, so, so that's again the foundation. Whether you actually achieve flourishing is 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 um, uh, undetermined in that definition. Bill, there's a question from the chat. Yeah. Um, Bill is curious if we're distinguishing value, like in value proposition, and values like social and ethical ethic norms. Yeah, that's a great question, and it comes up, and we actually contend with that uh, in the blueprint. Um, our, as I mentioned earlier, our our um, uh, partner Hank Hedders in particular voiced that and another advocation partner Gil Friends um, pointed it out in one of our working group meetings and essentially um, you know people will say that oh well you know you have to distinguish between value and values one of the things that we're asserting here is that that's actually a false dichotomy that um, that you know value particularly the way that it's understood now through a financial lens um, and values that actually separating those two out is part of the problem. And that essentially the definition that we're drawing from says that our values or the things that we consider fit and desirable should be aligned with our sense of value in the terms of value creation. Um, so that's a that's a, a brief response, Bill. I I I, I um, you know that's that's a, a a tease, but do know that that's addressed um, in in the blueprint. So so we're not seeing that as a, a dichotomy, and we see the work of this blueprint to actually bring those back into um, uh, into alignment. Um, so uh, one of the places that this is over ought. Um, uh, equation uh, expresses itself is as the sustainability equation. And so that was actually when McElroy um, proposed the is over ought uh, equation, he did it specifically to tee up the sustainability quotient, um, which is S equals A over N, or sustainability equals actual impacts uh, on the carrying capacities of the capitals over normative impacts. So actual impacts are, this is what a company, for example, what it actually uh, impacted. It's actual impacts on the, the, the capitals, natural capital, social capital, human capital, et cetera, uh, compared to what those, those impacts would need to be in order to be sustainable. So if this is carbon, the, the A would be their carbon footprint. The N would be their carbon footprint in the context of the carbon budget. Um, so we call this uh, numeration over denomination, and much of our work we point out that what's called sustainability nowadays 
um, and, and often sort of um, conflated as ESG, we think ESG is actually a more accurate term for most of what we see nowadays. Is ESG is numeration only, it's incrementalist. ESG has no um, true sustainability gene, as our partner Alan White, the co-founder of GRI, um, pointed out. It would need to be contextualized with a denominator or normatively in order to be sustainability. Um, so uh, just pausing there on the moment on the, the carrying capacities of the capitals, um, that's what I'm gonna walk you through in these next couple of slides. So this is from a book that if you aren't aware of this, uh, I highly recommend it. It changed my world over the last year. Um, I've been working with carrying capacities for quite a while, but this um, book, Overshoot by William Catton from 1980, um, as you can see, uh, addresses it on, on, the, on the, the cover. Uh, so carrying capacity in the ecological sense, we use it actually in a broader sense, but it's the maximum permanently supportable load. Um, and overshoot is growth beyond carrying capacity, which leads to crash and die off. Um, so this is drawing on the tradition of the limits to growth. Um, uh, certainly that's when carrying capacity uh, and the notion of, of overshoot and collapse um, was, was really first put on the map in 1972. What are uh, vital capital resources or the, the multiple capitals? Um, though you may recognize this um, graphic from Form for the Future. Jonathan Porritt uh, first conceptualized uh, the, this sort of distillation of the five capitals. The IIRC adds intellectual capital and calls it six capitals. Uh, Gregory Landway has 10. Um, Sean Esborn Hargens has eight. Um, you know, there's, there's many articulations of the capitals, um, but we use from our partner, Mark McElroy, the definition of capital as, as a stock of anything that yields a flow of valuable goods or services into the future. And McElroy also uh, uh, proposes two essential categories. So there's natural capital or nature-made resources. And then all of the other capitals are anthropogenic or anthro capitals, human-made resources. So that's just um, to help you understand the, the carrying capacities of the capitals um, uh, in this next slide. Uh, so we go back to the S equals A over N. Um, uh, formulation and what we see is that on the the social and economic bottom lines on the top of this where the gray uh, on the left is unsustainable performance is uh, um, below uh, 1.0 whereas above or equal to 1.0 is sustainable performance whereas with environmental bottom line or natural capital it's flipped where unsustainable performance is above 1.0 and sustainable performance is below. And that was the, the conceptualization that uh, essentially built on, on some of the work from um, United Nations Environment Project, in particular, Barbara Ward, uh, 1974, proposed the um, inner limits and outer limits. Um, and where we saw this most recently was uh, a few years after McElroy proposed this, um, Kate Rayworth proposed the, um, the meme, if you will, of the donut uh, with the, the uh, OPZ um, 1.0 uh, overage being the ecological ceiling where we see that climate change, land conversion, biodiversity loss, and nitrogen and phosphorus loading we are in overshoot right now, we collectively, uh, or what we might call overshoot and collapse, which means we are uh, operating in systemic fragility. Um, OPZ on the other side of the donut is the social foundations where, as you can see, we are in shortfall or in uh, shortfall and collapse. 
uh, on all 12 of the uh, social foundations. Uh, and this is as articulated by Kate Rayworth in a Lancet article in 2017 that provides all the background research for this. So essentially, this is what we're presenting as the baseline that could be considered universal to understand what value is. And this question of universality um, really got tested recently when there was a Maori um, articulation of the donut, where it translated these ecological ceilings and social foundations um, into the um, commensurate concepts in, um, in particularly the Te Reo uh, tradition of uh, Maori uh, from New Zealand. Um, and what's interesting about this is that they created um, not just this one, but another version that flipped it and said that actually they saw the ecological foundation and social ceiling because they saw the, 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 the um, mother earth, if you will, as the foundation. So they, they essentially um, changed the limits, if you will. But our, the point we're making here is that it is still universally applicable. They're still saying there are these foundations and there are these overages that we need to avoid and we really need to live in this sense of balance and harmony. So that brings us through the notion of value uh, that we will you know, continue to come back to, but that sets the foundations for the conversation. In terms of cycles, um, we return to William Catton from his Overshoot book, and he brings up the, the, the notion of the carbon cycle. Um, and notes that it is uh, a model of cooperation of circulation of carbon between the two big kingdoms of plants and animals uh, in a climax or normatively ideal community. So this is a community that's working um, in, uh, uh, in that kind of harmony. Uh, the, the organic fixation of carbon by photosynthesis um, is in balance with the oxidation of carbon uh, to the atmosphere by respiration. Um, so we're appealing to this as uh, basically saying that this notion of a cycle is uh, biomimetic. It's something that we can look to nature to, um, uh, to, to draw on as our example of something, of, of a model that's enduring. Uh, and our notion uh, essentially is that lasting value for all is created cyclically and systemically. So that's sort of, if we had to distill this blueprint down, that's what we would say. We, we flesh it out a lot more than that, but that's the, the essence. Um, and then just to, to give a, 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 an idea of um, this notion of cycles, uh, also drawing on a cycle from the, the anthropogenic space, um, that knowledge is, uh, has a life cycle. In other words, knowledge is created uh, cyclically. And as we said earlier, value is essentially a form of knowledge. Value is something that we humans agree to. It isn't something that is a priori, it's something that we bring to the table. And so that means that we have to continually generate and regenerate this knowledge. So as you can see, there is a double feedback loop in the knowledge life cycle where we're continually generating knowledge, but then also evaluating in a double loop um, the knowledge that we've created and deciding what do we hold on to and what do we let go of? This draws on the notion of single loop learning and double loop learning from uh, 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 Chris Aguirre's and Don Shun um, from the 70s. And the one thing that we add to this is the notion of triple loop learning, um, where it takes one step even beyond the, the, the double loop and it essentially asks um, not only are we looking, are we doing the right things, which is what single loop learning asks, 
and um, uh, excuse me, are we doing things right is what single loop learning asks. Are we doing the right things expands the scope one step further. And then triple loop learning actually says, how do we establish rightness? So essentially, that's what we're doing. We're doing a, a process of triple loop learning with this blueprint because we're trying to establish rightness as a kind of synonym for value, if you will. So we've, we've gone uh, essentially outside of the boundary of, of what people often work with to look at the underlying um, question of value itself. Uh, and, and this is an example of a, a cycle, um, if you will. Uh, let's see. Okay, there we go. Um, so this is the, 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 um, the flow of value that we're gonna go through. Um, shareholder value, um, I don't think that I have to spend too long. And in fact, we don't spend too long in that in the blueprint, um, establishing that shareholder value is essentially, um, as, as Mariana Mazzucata calls it, a destructive idea. Um, and that this notion that uh, the, the, the financialization of a company is the only measure of value is, is really problematic. Um, and I, I, I use the Jack Welch quote. He's, he, he, he said that, that you know, shareholder value is the dumbest idea in the world um, uh, um, in order to say, well, actually, it, it's a good idea. But I figured I'd cop this quote just to um, uh, catch him, if you will. Um, uh, uh, we appeal to Lynn Stout, um, who just passed away recently, as, as did Jack Welsh, um, but Lynn Stout um, and the myth of shareholder uh, value um, really uh, sort of pokes holes in the, the um, epistemological underpinnings, you might say, of shareholder primacy. Um, so she points out that really it, it doesn't have a basis in history uh, law or in empirical evidence, but then she also points out that it's intellectually incoherent because of this idea of a monolithic notion of value uh, that would apply to all shareholders. You know, what, what is valuable from a financial sense to one shareholder may actually be um, uh, uh, not provide value to another uh, shareholder. So this is um, uh, she she pokes holes in it. We don't spend too long on this because we don't feel like it's a, it's a uh, uh, a doctrine that it holds much currency um, uh, going into the future. Uh, the next sort of the first, if you will, um, attempts at, at at redefining shareholder value was the notion of shared value from coming from Porter and Kramer, uh, Michael Porter. Um, from Harvard, uh, and uh, Kevin Moss shared this with me in, in 2012, Kevin Moss from World Resources Institute um, via British Telecom. Um, and he, he basically says that uh, this notion of creating shared value, that, that, that the idea of looking at an intersection of, of financial value and social solutions is fine, but it ignores the part where um, the, those things don't align, and there are actually places where industry creates problems that do not give easy solutions, and that's essentially ignored by shareholder value. Um, our our, our uh, um, working group member, Caroline Reese from Shift, uh, essentially says the same thing. Um, in uh, more detail, and she says it so um, articulately that we believe that this is worth um, uh, presenting in its entirety. So I won't read the whole thing on this uh, on this call. It's there in the blueprint, um, and you know I'm glad to share these slides uh, after after the this call. Uh, but essentially. Uh, she points out that, that this notion that they're, that they're the same priority of, of profit and um, value to society is actually not true, that, that profit is the prerequisite and value to society is secondary, um, and that it uh, actually does not resolve with its win-win model the we-win-you-lose paradigm that it's coming out of. 
And so, um, uh, as she says at the very end, I think most articulately, it, it simply isn't a win-win proposition unless the win for the company is seen as something other than profit and CSV can't tolerate that. So it's essentially still uh, got a foot in the shareholder primacy model is part of the problem with shared value. Um, next, we considered this notion of valueism from one of our working group members, Paul Barnett of Strategic Management Forum. Um, and Barnett um, noticed from this um, McKinsey study uh, that uh, corporate boards as uh, recently as 2013, when where they were asked, uh, you know, how many of them understand the value creation model of their companies, uh, only 16% in 2011 and 22% in 2013 had a complete understanding of the value creation model of their companies. And he felt like this was um, quite problematic. Um, and so he is uh, proposing this notion of valueism which uh, in some ways uh, goes beyond what we are proposing in the value cycles blueprint, um, uh, which we, we welcome in a sense. So he's defining um, uh, prosperity as human flourishing and well-being for this and future generations. And as he notes, uh, that goes beyond sustainability. Um, what we, uh, I would say, quibble with uh, Paul about is uh, that, that we believe that in order to measure human flourishing and well-being, that you really have to take a thresholds-based approach. Uh, and, and Paul remains skeptical of thresholds and sort of in vice versa, we remain skeptical uh, with healthy skepticism, I would say, and mutually respect respectful skepticism um, uh, of valueism being a doctrine that will um, truly deliver if it doesn't have firm foundation in a threshold-based approach. Um, we've seen too many approaches that uh, do not embrace thresholds that we simply believe don't uh, hold water ultimately. Um, now the question of valuation, um, so monetizing or putting a price tag on something, uh, Mazzucato says that uh, essentially, price has become the indicator of value, and we have this perverse situation where rather than the theory of value determining price, it is the theory of price that determines value, uh, and we believe that this is quite problematic. So when we look at the question of value, what we see is that uh, the OED says that it is the regard that something is held to deserve, the importance, worth, or usefulness of something, and it's only the secondary meaning that it is the material or monetary worth of something. Um, and then even uh, below that is the worth of something compared to the price paid or asked for it. So it's really only definition 1.1 that um, really aligns with how value is most often used uh, as the financially uh, financialized notion of it. The other two definitions really um, go beyond that financial notion. Um, yet, um, when valuation is applied, uh, particularly to the sustainability field, um, valuation is the mechanism that is now being used in order to make it palpable to the existing um, mindsets that we find in many boards and C-suites. So on this screen, we have the various different methodologies that all uh, fall under the rubric that we would say of impact valuation. So they're looking at impacts across all areas, um, ecological, social, and financial. And they're saying, let's put a price tag on them. That will solve things because if we put a price tag on it, that's something that corporate managers recognize it's speaking in their language. Um, so this is the, the uh, uh, versions from PwC, KPMG, EY. Deloitte also has one, but they just didn't have very good graphics. Uh, so I, I, I use the fourth of uh, the Crown Estate has its total contribution approach. Uh, so that's uh, an example from an individual company. Um, the problem that we find with this is two things. One that will be very familiar to this um, group 
uh, is the question of the fungibility of the capitals. This really cuts to the core of the distinction between weak sustainability and strong sustainability. Um, weak sustainability essentially saying, well, you can just swap out the capitals, that they're fungible, if you will. Uh, and we say, no, 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 impacts on a capital are not necessarily swappable with uh, impacts on another capital precisely because of the second notion here, the carrying capacities of these capitals. So in fact, if the impacts on capital A carry it outside of the carrying capacity or what that um, capital can handle, then we've gone awry. Um, and as we say here, impact valuation is blind to these carrying capacity thresholds. Um, I'm going to walk you through, and this is this is sort of the mo most in depth that we go with any of our examples. Um, but I'll walk through it relatively quickly. Um, uh, this is something we've been saying in various different fora. Uh, we point to the integrated reporting IARC um, uh, octopus, or or twelve opus, whatever you would call it, um, twelve legs instead of eight. But the point here is that. Um, uh, we have these uh, six different capitals as inputs from the external operating environment uh, into a company that transforms it and creates uh, outputs um, that then lead to outcomes. So that, that was where they had expressed things, and this is actually an issue right now <laughs> in the IRC um, revision framework. Uh, do we call this outcomes, or uh, as BASF did here, um, take it two steps further from outcomes to impacts, which is what's a, a company's attribution of that outcome? What is its part of that? Uh, and then ultimately to what they call the value to society or the societal benefit or cost, um, which we embrace the fact that they're taking a look that far out. We have a little bit of a difference on the details. Um, and when we look at, that can be demonstrated by when you look at their um, accounting for this or their reporting. So this is their, their um, uh, uh, performance between 2016 and 2017. As we can see, they've got positive performance on the economic and social side of things and negative performance on the natural capital side of things. Um, and, and, and I think it's really the scales at the bottom where they say, well, since we've got more positive performance, overall, we're doing fine, is essentially um, what, what they're saying with their methodology and not recognizing that, well, actually, if you continue to have negative performance on the environment um, over time, that is um, by definition unsustainable. So your positive uh, impacts on, on one side of the ledger do not um, negate uh, or, or uh, uh, eradicate the negative uh, uh, impacts on the other side. So, but this is, this is, is uh, sort of baked into the strongly sustainable uh, definition, so I trust familiar to you all. Uh, this is just by way of saying that the BA, BSF, BASF um, methodology just got um, uh, uh, ingested by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development with its impact valuation um, uh, roundtable, which is essentially saying the same thing here. Uh, and what we pause and, and we say, uh, um, is, it, is it the capitals that we're measuring or is it impacts on the capitals that we're measuring? And particularly the sustainability of those impacts. That's the key distinction here. And what we see is that um, impact valuation just measures the capitals without measuring ultimately the impacts, uh, the sustainability of those, those impacts. Um, and I'll, I'll give two examples. This is, one is from, again, our, our partner, Mark McElroy. Uh, he noted this in 2014, that um, on the left-hand side, we're applying monetization. Um, you know, so, so, you know, as you're working from your, your flows, uh, whittling that down to your core stocks of a resource, ecological resource in this instance, the cost goes up um, uh, until the key is once you get to the 1.0, 
that cost has to be what he says is negatively infinite. Um, and uh, in, in un so in other words, when you're cutting into your stocks that um, compromise your flows, you have to cost this out of the market, so to speak. And this is something that essentially the same thing is said by a group of um, Oxford uh, researchers. I think this is 2018. They, they called that line the critical natural capital line. So we're, we're just looking um, um, swapped here directionally, where they're saying essentially that, that you know, the, 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 the cost of something would need to rise, but supply and demand economics don't have that dotted line. They don't recognize that actually there's a, 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 an area of critical capital that you, uh, once you cross into that, you're compromising the system. So we just simply say that if we take ourselves back to the octopus, um, we would need to sort of superimpose these next two levels. And um, instead of calling it uh, value to society, we would call this uh, actually system value that ultimately that's what we're looking to create across all of these capitals. Um, and the notion of system value was actually, um, we believe, defined fairly well, even though it didn't use this term, uh, I'll, I'll define the term in just a moment, um, by the uh, 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 value creation background paper that uh, the IARC commissioned back in 2012 uh, before its framework came out that EY did. And uh, this is paragraph 58, the last paragraph in this paper, which we actually think is one of the best articulations. Um, it, it actually doesn't mention the capitals. They're in there implicitly. It doesn't mention system value. It's in there implicitly. But uh, essentially, that value is to be interpreted by reference to thresholds um, uh, that, that aligned to the carrying capacity and limits of resources on which stakeholders and companies rely on for their well-being and profit. Um, ultimately, what those thresholds and limits are, how the resources within those limits should be allocated, a key term for, for our work, and what action is needed to keep activity within those limits so that value can be created over time. That's the core question. We think that's a pretty darn good definition of value creation that would essentially align with what the Future Fit Business Benchmark calls system value. We've been taking this term and really kind of developing it beyond what Future Fit has done um, up until now. But as you, I'm sure, know, Future Fit, um, uh, having really been spawned in this community by Bob Willard, um, that it's an inherently thresholds based uh, approach. And so this notion of that, that business is nested within society and environment and that in order to create value across all of those realms, you uh, have to be thinking systemically within those thresholds. So um, we uh, actually have uh, in our data blueprint, we visualize this through a um, uh, integral uh, data uh, flowchart where we basically say that you would have to look at um, data coming from macro, meso, and micro levels. So uh, micro organizational, meso um, uh, industry, uh, macro systems, uh, ecological, social, and financial systems across all of the capitals integrating that. So you'd have to take these external data, combine it with internal data, and then assess it in terms of the thresholds, the ecological and social thresholds, the donut, if you will, you'd have to um, layer, uh, lay a donut across it, and you'd have to assess the allocations, how much goes to each company, if you will, that then you could actually assess performance and make a determination if it's in a binary sense, either sustainable or unsustainable, and in Tim's sort of great gradiated sense, is it, uh, you know, even beyond sustainable to regenerative or thriving or unsustainable? Is it, you know, still incrementally moving towards sustainability or is it actually degenerative? Um, that could then be benchmarked as we're seeing happening from the World Benchmarking Alliance and then 
disaggregated back out to these the macro, meso, and micro levels. Um, but ultimately, we would then be able to measure um, system value holistically as well as in a disaggregated sense. Um, so that's our, our visualization of system value. Um, and then we, we, we added this additional chapter on intrinsic value, really kind of going to that question of critical natural capital from the Oxford report, um, that essentially we need to recognize that there's, there's values that, that don't articulate as capitals. There's value that uh, doesn't articulate um, as uh, um, befitting valuation. Um, so we think Lennon McCartney uh, uh, captured pretty well uh, in uh, Can't Buy Me Love from 1964. Um, so this brings us to, to cycles um, and um, just, you know, recognizing that there, there may be questions, um, if it makes sense to, to pause and, and see if there are questions here or if I should keep, keep going on, on cycles. Tim and, and Lori, is there? Anything bubbling up from um, the I sidebar? Would, I should pause and, and, and answer before going forward. I would address this uh, to the group. If there's uh, something that you'd like to address uh, right now, I think this is a good a good chance. If not, then we'll do it after the end of the Great. talk. Great. Yeah. And, and this will be shorter. Oh. Hi, Bill. Can I ask a question now? It's yeah. Yeah. Great, Simon. Hi, Bill. I've been really enjoying this and you know thinking about how it integrates with our holonomic approach. Uh -huh. Could you just talk a little bit about where you're at with the blueprint in terms of do you have any case studies yet where it's been applied? Because I think for me, just one of my general comments about the regenerative community right now is that there's still quite a lot of theory and not so much applied work happening. And you just get mm -hmm. so much learning from applied cases. You know, this for me is where the, a lot of the learning can happen. That's, that's great, Simon. And um, the, uh, we actually have a similar answer across all of our blueprints, which is the blueprints are, are sometimes in, include case studies. Um, but generally speaking, we uh, typically build those out um, after the facts and we being in the larger sense. So um, uh, R3.0 has, a, R3.0 is a very small organization and recognizing that a small organization would be limited in its impact, we have a, um, an ecosystem around us of, uh, I forget actually how many it is, it's some maybe 80 or, or more um, advocation partners and academic alliance members. Um, and so um, we, we rely on them to really do the deep work of um, uh, case study development. So really the, the, the blueprint is the first um, step in the process um, and we put it out as an invitation for people saying oh actually this is happening um, here or there so so it, it's it's um, uh, we, we recognize that that it may sort of um, hold people back to have to, to, to be lacking those case studies but but it's a big enough um, a project, if you will, to, to build out the theoretical um, uh, underpinnings of it. So that's what we, we focus the blueprint on. Um, I, I, I don't know if Ralph is still on, but I'm, I'm pretty, we've, we've actually already gotten during the, the um, public comment period um, requests from some of our advocation partners and, and beyond uh, to, to do those case studies to, to essentially animate um, this. Uh, and, and I would say also on the larger, on the, you know, if we're talking about the regenerative community, I, I, um, we work very closely with John Fullerson and the Capital Institute. Um, uh, and I, I, I would point to their field guide um, on regenerative uh, economy um, as uh, containing, I believe, 40 or so case studies. So, so while I, I agree that there's, you know, it would be helpful to be more, I, I don't think that that um, you know the regenerative economic community is 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 completely devoid of, of case studies. So, I, I hope that you know answered it sufficiently at least as a, as a first first answer. And, and I guess I'd also say Simon that we would um, welcome partnering around um, case studies. You know, particularly if if uh, you were to join us as an advocation partner, um, which is not it's very very straightforward. Um, 
uh, so, so building out a repository of case studies aligned with our blueprints is in our uh, overarching plans. Yeah, that's excellent. Just, I just want to kind of provide a little bit of context for my comments in that you don't, if, you, if you look at, the, say, the Brazilian business market, McKinsey, Accenture, and DY absolutely dominates. But it's really interesting in that a lot of our big clients, they're already working, obviously, with you know, the big consultancies. And it's not a dichotomy. It's not either or. Mm -hmm. We're actually, with Holonomics, we're being asked to come in and sometimes partner, sometimes kind of join a consultancy ecosystem to provide these alternative perspectives. And it's this kind of context that I feel is missing right now. How do you actually introduce a lot of this deep thinking into organizations? It's not by kind of dismissing, you know, what's already happening through partnerships and through being quite intelligent. You can really introduce this at boardroom level in certain ways. And it's this kind of more practical advice for how do you get into, how do you get this level of thinking into boardrooms that I'm always looking for? you know, mm -hmm. to, to complement the way that we're, we're doing it. And I think it is an interesting trend that big global brands are seeing space to open up what they're doing with people like McKinsey and bringing in more specialists to complement and expand because especially with this COVID crisis, I've really seen a change of thinking already because, you know, as, as you probably receive them, you know, we receive one or two confidential McKinsey reports and, this is why, you know, some CEOs, boardrooms are thinking, you know what, we do agree with this, but there's a little bit here that we don't agree. So there's a recognition they need to change their thinking. And this is where things like the blueprint can come in and to complement what we're already doing with the flourishing business canvas, holonomics and save the three horizons model. That, that was just the context of my question. That, that, that's great, and Simon. It, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll say sort of to round that out and, and come back into the, the cycle section. Um, uh, is that you know part of our our decision of of that uh, approach uh, is you know as our nonprofit um, status um, that uh, you know we're really focused on the the the, the educational and um, uh, sort of theoretical side of things and you know not that we are necessarily barred from the um, uh, case studies if you will but. We find that, that those who are actively engaged with organizations producing those case studies is, is ideal. And that is actually, you know, that's something that we, we really, um, uh, our nonprofit status would uh, be risked, I would say, uh, if we are actively engaging in a, what could be perceived as a, as a consulting um, framework with, uh, with companies. So that's why we're, we're sort of like, um, uh, welcoming that coming from the the the, the consulting field. Um, yeah, no, t I totally ex totally accept and understand that. But I, I think there's a very interesting conversation to be had. Yeah, about kind of changing the regenerative conversation to you know to really help people understand yeah. how to, how this can have an impact. You know, really for, in the field. That's great. That's great. Yeah. I and I, I I appreciate your input, and I have long appreciated your your work. So thank you, Simon. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to um, continue on and try to, this is a shorter section, I'm going to try to move through it more quickly. Um, so, uh, and I, you know, I don't really feel like I have to, to say too much. We all know uh, this uh, graphic, Porter's value chain, um, obviously, somewhat in the spirit of what um, Simon is saying, you know, we're, we're not suggesting that we throw this out. Um, value, the, the notion of a value chain will still have relevance, and, and you'll see this a, a little bit later. Linearity is, um, uh, does still exist in systems. Um, the question is if we view that as the only thing or the end uh, of our, our, as far as our lens can see. And that's the problem that we see most often is that a value chain conception um, limits the viewpoint. Um, so this is just an example of the um, limitations of value chain as compared to um, an ecological economics approach. Um, and obviously, I'm not going to go into depth on this, but that's sort of what we do in, in the blueprint. Um, 
so we move from value chains through, we do a pretty in-depth look at the circular economy, first just um, establishing it and the, you know, here the obvious, uh, the butterfly uh, graphic from, from Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, but uh, what we do is, is we, we do note um, in particular, um, and, and this study uh, by one of our Academic Alliance members, Nancy Bakken and uh, some colleagues, um, that the assumption that the circular economy is the end goal is, is we believe, um, problematic. So people believe that if they just say circular and are working towards circularity, um, that that will resolve all of our problems. And uh, this paper does a great job of articulating the ways that the circular economy is actually not aligned with a sustainable economy and that really what we would need to do is merge circularity with sustainability um, uh, uh, as, as a way forward. Um, so this is a good graphic of, of recognizing the elements that are part of the solutions for a circular economy that are fused with the elements that are necessary for uh, a uh, uh, sustainable uh, economy as, uh, um, through sustainable business models. So again, the, the, the point here being that we need both of these elements together. Um, we say this uh, uh, in a lot, a lot more uh, elegantly or articulately um, uh, in, in the blueprint. Um, and just more of the same, but I'm, I'm not gonna uh, try to, at this point in, the, in a presentation, um, explain, explain this. The other point that we make is we draw on uh, one of our working group members and advocation partners, uh, Alexander Lemille, um, has recognized that the biological and technological um, focus of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation approach to circular economy has really left the human element um, out of the mix and so has integrated this into what he calls the circular uh, human sphere. Um, and so that's something that we're embedding into the blueprint. We're actually, um, as we move into the final draft, we're condensing that section because we've been um, told by many people that, um, uh, that, that getting a more distilled version of it would actually be helpful. So we're gonna retain the entire um, explanation in our appendix, but include a, a, a distilled version um, in the blueprint itself. And again, uh, you know, due to time constraints, I'm, I'm not gonna go into depth on this. The, the, the key point for our purposes is just um, uh, in addition to reconciling circularity with sustainability, uh, also reconciling it to the human element. Um, so finally, the, uh, uh, um, in our work on looking at the circular economy in particular, what we noted was, um, that it was not taking into account uh, the, the uh, thermodynamics of the situation. And uh, one of our advocation partners and working group members, Martin Veening from Entropometrics, um, uh, has played a key role in understanding this. Uh, and so essentially that we need to be articulating our understanding of value um, within a thermodynamic understanding so that we can um, preserve these systemic thresholds. So you see that he's, he's recognizing the key to um, a thresholds-based approach uh, as a means of defining and understanding um, value. Um, so I, I'm not gonna go into depth on this one, but this is uh, um, from one of our uh, uh, many uh, multiple times um, conference speakers, uh, James Quilligan works with Economic Democracy Advocates, uh, also has done some um, uh, 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 advising to the IMF, for example. Um, this is in an introduction to a peer-to-peer uh, -peer foundation report on thermodynamic accounting, um, where he basically is, is pointing out um, that the commons movement that the Peer to Peer Foundation is coming out of, uh, and particularly the work of Eleanor Ostrom, um, never addressed the carrying capacity issue. So did not get down to that level of the thermodynamic 
um, uh, energy and material flows, if you will, um, uh, on the, the basis of a commons. Um, so th that uh, doing so would provide an empirical way of measuring the metabolism of society. So Quilligan is essentially articulating what we are trying to get at here. Um, and by doing so, you would be able to measure, um, in the second part of here, the replenishment of renewable and non-renewable resources and managing them to sustain their yield. Um, that would provide uh, alternative indicators um, uh, that we would need to, to steer our economies and uh, uh, markets more broadly. Um, and I come back to the question of thermodynamics. We actually delve into it much more deeply um, in the blueprint, but just for the sake of time, um, we, we, we say that this question of cycles in particular needs to be addressed at a bioregional level. Um, and we're calling this circulation just in um, a nod to the Capital Institute's notions of the pr eight principles of a regenerative economy, and in particular, the one of robust circulation. And uh, uh, um, Capital Institute is the, the, the convener of the Regenerative Communities Network that is uh, operating globally uh, at the bioregional level. Um, we at R3.0 have just uh, joined and I am a convener of the Connecticut River Valley Bioregional Collaborative in the Regenerative Communities Network. So we're actually looking to um, apply some of this work in a research setting um, uh, at the bioregional level. Um, and, uh, uh, our, our, our friend um, Joe Brewer, who spoke eloquently at our conference last year, uh, um, talks about the need to uh, approach things at a, a bioregional level, um, that we need to create this um, cyclical uh, cycling of value uh, at, uh, uh, within bioregions as a way of uh, uh, scaling upward or actually scaling laterally, if we will. Um, and so the point that we're trying to make here is that we believe that the bioregional scale is uh, uh, um, the ideal scale to be uh, applying the notion of uh, ecological Economies as ecologies, uh, as uh, uh, our partner James Quillian says, and uh, as we're calling it, cyclical economies. Um, here is John Fullerton um, noting that in nature, really, that this cyclical approach um, it, uh, involves uh, fractal relationships. And I'm going to, just noting the time, I'm going to move fairly quickly into um, one way of looking at this fractal uh, and in fact going to, uh, this is from our, our partner Martin Veening, who I noticed before, uh, mentioned before, um, talking about this sort of the linear as compared to circular, as compared to cyclical, as compared to spiral. What we're proposing in this blueprint is that um, each of these is actually relevant. So sort of in line with what Simon is saying, we're not necessarily rejecting the value of these vi views, but that um, depending on where you are looking at a system, that you would be looking at it as linear. Uh, so what Veening points out is that if you look at a tree, you could notice that there's a linear value system in the sense of water flowing into the tree in a linear way. When you pull back, uh, or likewise, if you're looking at, it would look like a circle, if you're looking at the buds um, uh, uh, germinating over the winter, rising in the spring, um, you've got your leafing in the summer, that ends, and then it goes into dormancy. That's looking very circular. You scope back and look at a tree ring, and you'll notice that it's actually happening in a spiral. So that those circles 
when they aggregate over time uh, are actually spiral. And it, he's got the, 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 the linear notion of water and minerals and light uh, photosynthesis um, linear in one sense, but if you step back to a, to a larger scale or proportionality, we of course know that, that water operates in a cycle. Minerals, carbon, phosphorus, um, uh, nitrogen operate in cycles. So what we're really saying here is that it's about what scale are you looking at for whether you're uh, addressing the question of, of lines, circles, or cycles, uh, or spirals. Um, finally, and I'm, I'm actually going to um, uh, um, not go into depth on, on this. Um, this is largely the, the area where we tie this into our other blueprints. Um, but ultimately, what we're saying here is when we look at the, the ultimate uh, notion, in our first chapter of value, that we're saying that, that system value plus value cycles is where we get to the notion of system value cycles from our um, uh, title. Um, and we, in this blueprint, we reconfigured our, um, what had been our strategy continuum into what we're now calling a maturity matrix. Um, and we're using this to represent the dividing line in the middle between unsustainable and sustainable performance uh, from incremental, if you will, into transformative performance. And on the vertical axis, uh, on the scale from nano individual to micro organizational meso um, uh, sector portfolio uh, habitat, macro to the systems to the supra level of the sort of existential level, if you will. Um, and we just map out where some of the concepts fit onto this um, maturation matrix, um, just to give a sense. And we're not, we're not even claiming that these are you know, steadfast um, uh, placements. We actually find that just the, the, the uh, act of trying to place them um, is helpful. So um, I'm going to leave it here, um, just noting that um, we do still have the opportunity for um, input on the value cycles blueprint. Um, this is the uh, landing page uh, is the first link. Uh, we have a medium article that reprints the uh, uh, executive summary. And then finally, the comment uh, draft we have on our website. Um, all of this is readily findable on the internet. Um, so, uh, but just making you aware of that. Um, also, uh, recognizing that um, the value cycles will be one of the key things that we're addressing in our um, conference coming up in, uh, in September 8th through 11th. Um, and I'm recognizing, we, we you know, pause to take some questions in the middle. I um, spoke longer than I was intending. So my apologies for not leaving uh, a, a ton of time for questions, but uh, over, over to you, Tim and Lori, for, for that now, for the degree that people have uh, time to, to, to take that. In my opinion, everything needed to be said. I actually really needed to hear this presentation today. So I'm very grateful that uh, you were here and I was here to hear it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lori. I absolutely agree. Uh, I think we're all happy that you took a bit more time. Um, all Thank of it you. was very valuable. And um, as just for, for ourselves, I think uh, we do not need to cut this off right here. I don't know if you would have five more minutes if there are more questions. You do. That's great. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, I would say we'd, we'd still open the room for uh, a couple more questions um, if you'd like to just uh, speak up and uh, feel free to ask your questions. People need to think about it. I do have one that I would like to address, um, which I was wondering, um, since you also mentioned uh, you, you're kind of, you're implementing the, the human ele element into circularity. Um, one thing that, that came up for me also was um, that my background is more in service science, which likes to think of itself as the science of value creating activities, right? And so there's an emerging kind of new um, understanding of value as, um, as we move away from financial value. And um, so some certain characteristics about value and the way it's created, for example, that it's experiential, right? 
um, that I can't predetermine value, but it depends on my experience. It depends on the entire, for example, use phase of a product, or it depends on the context that I um, will be using a product or a service in. Um, so, so value is experiential in that sense. Value is multidimensional, as we saw also before, but it's, it's not just financial value. It can be emotional, social, et cetera, value. Mm -hmm. And what I'm just wondering with value as a concept that is so complex, we've been talking a lot about benchmarking, measuring uh, in order to be able to report, right? How are we able um, to really measure and report the value creation um, if value is actually a concept that's, that's not just monetary and can be can be valued through pricing, right? But if it's if it's experiential in so many other ways, um, is that something that we need to look away from? The, the fact that we maybe can't um, really um, quantify value, or what what would you what would your research suggest on that? Yeah, I, get, I, I mean, I, I in some ways my first answer, and this may be a, a lazy one, um, would be a, a reiteration of the the decision that we made to uh, essentially recognize that that. You know, the dividing line between deciding if something has value and doesn't have value is essentially, is it degenerating or regenerating? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, going back to that matrix, you know, one of the things that um, uh, our partner, Alexander Laszlo, who uh, I'm actually going to be talking on one of our um, uh, future normals webinars tomorrow with Alexander as well as Ralph who's on the call uh, and, and Lou Smitsman. Um, uh, what he says is, is that um, the issue with regeneration is that if we're just regenerating, it actually doesn't um, encompass the element of transcendence or flourishing um, or thriving, if you will. And I think that's part of what you're, you're, you're saying here, Tim, is that there's an element where, okay, if we're baselining, um, you know, we believe that baselining to sustainability is a, 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 a sort of a, a valid exercise. Um, personally, I become less interested in, in measuring the, the quote unquote value as it moves towards thrivability. Uh -huh. Partly because um, there's really not a need. There, there's the, the, that that measurement actually provides less value because once I'm into the regenerative zone or into the sustainable zone, um, it actually doesn't matter. I'm, uh, there's no additional value in in in, in my sense of. Um, uh, be moving towards thriving that needs to be measured at least. Certainly there, you know, there, there may be more uh, uh, value that one could measure. So this is really just a personal statement. In terms of our, our research, I, I'd say actually that it, um, unless, unless there's something um, that Ralph wants to chime in on, I'm actually not aware of our radar screen um, having that on it. So that's actually something we're, we're pretty um, voracious, um, uh, readers and uh, accepting of uh, of research. So, if you'd want to share some of that with us, um, I don't can't make any promises on whether it would make it into the blueprint. But um, I I think I can promise that that we would ingest it. Well, thanks for for that answer, and I'm I'm absolutely willing to share, of course, uh, and, and then we'll see if it makes it anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it might be good, Tim, to qualify that that uh, that value within services is also developed out of service dominant logic. There exactly. might be a new logic for the co-creation of value within ecosystems uh, that that would be at a higher level than service that would take into account the co-creation of service logic and goods logic, because those are also different uses of capital. But perhaps as you as you are more implicated within the system that you're drawing the capital from. So when you buy a good and you use it, it's a use value. But as you go up to services, it's more integrated. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if there is a, another concept within the science of flourishing that we could consider or may have to, may look at in terms of more integrated value co-creation in, in, within the bioregion, the ecosystem and our participation. There's probably an indigenous term for that. <laughs> yeah, uh, Peter. Um, thank you. Um, good to good to be on the line with you again. Um, 
you, actually, your comments brought up um, some of the work that James Quilligan is doing, and it's actually very sort of um, preliminary right now. So it's actually not not at a stage where it's it's ready to be integrated into the value um, uh, blueprint. But uh, he is looking at uh, use value and exchange value being sort of the well understood notions of value, and seeing a a a, a next logical step of distributed value. So again, sort of tying in the, uh, A, the notion of sort of regenerative and distributive economies, and also making it a more of a peer-to-peer -peer exchange um, or a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, sharing of value that, that, that really what we need to be moving towards is this notion of instead of, um, you know, our, our, a neoliberal economy is basically um, incentivizing the hoarding of value, uh, the concentration of value, if you will. Um, and the, uh, hey, take it easy, Ralph. Good to, thank you for, uh, for staying up so late. Um, the, but, but really, what Absolutely. We should... Yeah, it's transactional. And what we're talking right. about, distributed, I like that term. I think of it as participatory uh, from a design yes. perspective, but, but because there's a co-creation aspect to it. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And, and also that, that value then doesn't need to be um, sort of enclosed. So if we look at the, you know, tracing back to the, the, to the um, really to, to the beginnings of, of some of our, the economic systems that we've um, inherited now, that, that really the enclosing of the commons was a way of enclosing value. And so one way to go against, uh, you know, to, to, to create a, a different directionality to it is to have the value be distributed. So uh, thank you for that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, uh, Michael. Yeah, um, f thanks for a great presentation. I'm gonna share with my friends who works with this as well. So, but I, my interest is in what, what new roles and identities and do we need in society to work with things like this? So, so what are your thoughts about people working with uh, the awareness of value and the creation of value? What new roles, ident identities and titles should be used for people working with questions like these? Well, uh, I mean, I guess one, one answer that comes to mind immediately um, would be the notion of a chief value officer. And, and one of our partners, um, uh, Delphine Gibassier, uh, is with uh, Audencia University, um, and she's just uh, opening up a new research center on uh, integrated multi-capitalism. And it has uh, the very first um, MBA, uh, uh, Chief Value Officer MBA um, program. So, uh, and this is coming out of um, Mervyn King, who was a, a, a chair of the Global Reporting Initiative, as well as the Inter National Integrated Reporting Council, uh, a, you know, corporate governance guru from South Africa, um, has written a book a, a, a year or two ago called The Chief Value Officer. Um, I think what it's asserting here is the notion of value being the um, uh, aligning principle and particularly looking at value in this new lens. So I would say the, the work that we're doing is really, you know, picking up on my response to Simon, we're really tr just, just trying to set the, the intellectual and conceptual foundations for this and really looking to others um, to work in collaboration with around um, more clearly identifying the identities and roles that may fulfill, uh, enact the, this thinking. So I, I hope that, I hope that, that helps. Yeah, yeah, I would love to talk more about this because I'm Great. really interested in what we can do about this. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I, so I guess I'll, I'll reiterate that, um, you know, our, our conference is coming up. Ralph uh, put the link um, into, the, into the chat box there. And uh, the conference is, is structured with um, sort of four thematic pairings. Um, one of them is science and behavior. One of them is uh, uh, finance and growth, or we're skeptical of growth, or at least certain forms of growth. Uh, and then value and, and circularity, uh, and then finally education and governance. So there will be an entire track devoted to that. 
um, in, in addition to other sessions, um, and in fact, Morris, who's on, on the line, um, will be presenting in, in one of our market making ideas and solutions sessions on his great um, Thrive uh, platform, which I actually think would, would be an instantiation of um, being able to measure value in, in different ways. Um, so, so that's one place that I think that the conversation will be, um, will be happening and Michael, we'd be glad to, uh, you know, connect with you, um, if you're interested in particular in joining as an advocation partner, or academic alliance member. So, so glad to continue the conversation. Yeah. Thank you. I, I also just briefly wanted to add that, um, when we talk about value networks, and as you said, we're kind of moving away from just an organizational view of, on value to a dyadic view, uh, which in, in business research is often the, the business and the customer. But now we're talking about value networks and, yeah. and the notion in terms of roles that keeps coming up is to sort of also have a central, what they call a resource integrator, but someone who, who sort of orchestrates value creation for that system that, that we're talking about. Ah. So, so that's another new role that is being discussed a lot that uh, because we're thinking about value systems, value networks, that we need new, um, new roles, new, new actors that act as an orchestrator for value creation for the whole system, um, especially in systems of actors that, that still think very close and profit oriented um, to, to enable value creation for the entire system. That's that's interesting because I'm I'm actually you know as I mentioned I'm playing the role of systems convener uh, <laughs> for the Connecticut River Valley Bioregional Collaborative, um, and so this is sort of coming out of the network uh, theory yeah. uh, uh, notion that you know having somebody so I'm not you know I I don't necessarily have any more power than yeah, other no. members but um, that I'm mostly. Um, trying to, to to sort of have my finger on the pulse of the the health and coherence of the network, um, and the intersection between the network at the bioregional level and the network at the global level. Um, I'm doing the same thing with the uh, through that through the RCN, um, and uh, doing this uh, in, in part in collaboration with uh, Peter, the transformation systems um, mapping and analysis working group. Is, is part of that and I'm serving as a convener yeah. for, the, uh, for the system, um, uh, for the work stream on indicators, scorecards and dashboards. We're just, you know, we're just defining this right now. But the point being, yes, that there's a sort of a new role yeah. of a, a curator, if you will. And exactly, as you say, convener, curator, I think are good words because as you also said, it's not a, a power-based role. It's not, it's not that you have more power than anyone else. It's mostly about understanding that, that value creation um, is multi-directional and, and, and there's no clear supplier-customer relationship, but, but value is created both ways. And so if someone is needed who can kind of have an overview of this and facilitate cooperation, knowledge flows, and so on between all the actors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, that that that's great. So I I would um, I would love to 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 um, receive some of the the work from from you all on this. Absolutely. Um, I also just need to give a a a, a quick heads up. So um, I'm uh, I'm actually able to see my my partner. That we had a a uh, a storm here, as I mentioned earlier in the afternoon, and and she lives a, a mile away from me, and her power went out. So she asked if she could come do her uh, Zoom yoga class uh, in, in, in outside, and so I could see her doing that. And she, and she has a subsequent class at uh, at six fifteen. So uh, I'm uh, excuse me at six thirty. So I, I and I participate in that one. So I'm going to need to um, to to head out for that. In fact, she's calling right now. So um, uh, I want to thank everyone for this opportunity. Uh, and um, I really look forward to the recording of this and any follow-up uh, coming out of it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Bill. This was, this was truly amazing. Uh, we really enjoyed it, and uh, we hope you have a great yoga session now. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Stay in touch. Okay. Take care, all. Bye, Bill. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, everyone.